Emma. I mean, <laughs> Claire, Claire, that's Emma. Right. Um, all right, sorry, we're obviously flying by the seat of our pants, not our pants, our cute little brown dresses. <laughs> but our next speaker is, uh, is Emma Mulqueeny. She is the founder and CEO of Young Rewired State. She is a commissioner for the Speaker's Commission on Digital Democracy and a Google Fellow. She was voted one of the top 10 women in technology by The Guardian and was in the top 10 tech heroes for the good by Nesta, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. And she is still getting fixed up. Yes? Good, okay. Uh, back to our earlier discussion. <laughs> um, so who, who thinks they may have come from, who had the shortest journey to get here today? Anyone? Oh, yeah. Oh, very good, Sloan Square. Okay, can we beat that? Can we beat that? Yes? Holborn, okay, yeah, closer. Anyone? Anyone else closer? Yes? Holborn went, yeah, yeah, definitely. Good, good. And then, it, <laughs> Indeed. The, the circle line was, uh, I, don't, I almost hopped on it this morning, but then I was warned off because uh, they said it was, they said it was, um, there was, there was signal failures, and so I took a, a really circuitous route, but then I, I think that, I think I was lied to, actually. <laughs> so, I still got here, that's all right. Um, and I, though I loved our, our beautiful metaphorical answer to the question before, I am actually curious, did anyone come from like really far away to the conference? Yes? South Africa. South Africa. Can anyone beat South Africa? Oh, yes. Ghana. All right. Well, technically, no. <laughs> You're not going to beat South Africa unless, unless my geography is very poor. But, but very far. Well, well done. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. India, very good, fantastic. I'm so pleased to see all of you here. Uh, are we ready? Fantastic, all right. Please welcome Emma Mulqueeny. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Ah, yes, I'm, I feel a bit like Madonna, um, so forgive me, not quite used to the setup. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, what I call 97ers, um, but before I do that, I just want to um, tell you why I um, think that I can tell you about 97ers. So, um, in the introduction, uh, they said that I founded Young Rewired State. This is a community of um, self-taught programmers um, that I started with 50 kids in 2009. It took me three months to find them. Um, it was a bit of a drama, but that kind of was my first step, I guess into this whole education space and understanding um, what needed to change um, with regards to digital skills. So in 2009, I started this just as a kind of side thing to um, my main job. And it's grown now to um, a community of 1,000. Um, we've just run a huge festival of code. Um, we do this every year. Um, I'm also a um, mum of a 97er. Um, and so I see every day um, the things that I, the trends that I've been seeing amongst the YRS community actually um, being borne out by her. So this is the first time that I've ever talked about 97ers like this, and there's quite a lot of content, um, so please do feedback to me if it's too much, but um, there's just a lot of interesting stuff that I'd like you to kind of think about, um, because that's all I'm doing. This is just trends that I'm seeing. So, um, when I say 97ers, I mean um, those children that were born in 1997 or later. That's because these kids grew up with social media, which is very different to growing up being able to use this. So the digital natives, all of those people that um, are heralded um, as the beginning of the dig digital revolution. It's very true, they are. But um, social media has had a far more profound effect on these children, in my opinion. 
So I think um, the thing to bear in mind throughout um, everything that I say as well is that for the kids born in 1997, the background that they've grown up in, all they have known is recession and terrorism, as in what's happening worldwide. And all of this stuff is obviously shared through social media. And it's because of this that it affects them with regards to identity, work, social action, and democracy, which actually I've kind of rounded up into the same thing for the purpose of this talk. And um, I'm going to start uh, with identity. So, identifying yourself offline is easy. You can have your driving license, you can have a piece of paper, you've got someone that will verify that you are who you say you are and you're standing in front of people. Online, it's not so easy. But to these 97ers, to these kids that have grown up with social media, it's all they've ever known. And so to them, actually, it's quite alien to produce a piece of paper. And the way that they identify themselves and each other is through storytelling. So if you think of Facebook, for example, you say you are, you are a person, a name, might not necessarily be your name, might be your handle, but you say that you are a person. You verify who you are through photographs, for example. And other people know that you are who you say you are because they recognize their friends in your photographs or they know that you were at a certain event. And so through telling these stories through social media, all of the different platforms that are available to them, they verify their identity. If you've got someone who is pretending to be someone else, so is tagging themselves in a photo and everybody else knows that they are not that person, then they're very quickly outed and exposed. So they've got a fairly fail-safe way of identifying each other through community action. And so it's very important, again, when we think about education, which I'll come to at the end, to bear in mind that this is all they have ever known, the way that they identify themselves through their peers and through storytelling. We've never done that. And so, this is why it's very important that we don't police this too much. And I know that I'm speaking to the converted here, but for me it's even more important that we don't try to interfere with identity and, for example, through, you know, under the guise or, you know, whatever, um, of saying that we're keeping these kids safe online. We don't know how to keep these kids safe online. They do. And if we start mucking about with the way that they identify themselves and find a different offline way that we're happy with for them to use online, then we're going to start mucking about with community and that's going to have a ripple effect that is actually quite profound. So this is really important. We mustn't do this. Social action and democracy as well. I mean, obviously, democracy is a big thing for me in open data with what I do. Um, but also, again, for these children, they don't really know any different. So if you think about this, about the fact that they have known no different other than to have an opinion online that their peers will either rally behind or that they will argue against, that's an amazing thing to grow up having at your core and not having to learn. Also, because they are in these social media spaces and often younger than they should legally be in these social media spaces, they're exposed to stuff that's happening around the world at a much, much younger age. Their peers are telling them about FGM. Their peers are telling them about Coney. And that's how they're finding out about what's happening beyond their borders at a much earlier stage than anybody else has to date. So the first point that I put up there, and I, I don't like to talk to bullets usually, but I can say this and you'll cogitate it, but I really wanted you to 
be reading it as well. So, the first thing that this 97er has is an immediate way to test whether their thoughts and their beliefs and what they're saying chimes with their community. Because they immediately get a number of likes, or it immediately gets shared. And if it doesn't, then they know that they have to change the message, or that there's another way that they're going to have to find to activate their community behind them if they're passionate about it. I'm not saying these kids are like forever passionate about everything, but I'm saying this is their learned behavior. This is all they know. Can you imagine a politician that's grown up from age naught knowing that? It's hugely powerful. It's also quite scary. This sharing that they do from age seven in uh, Young Rewired State, I see it. Our youngest members are seven. They share the stuff that they see that they get cross about or that they're excited about. And that can be quite interesting things. And it can be quite, you know, it can be stuff that's like social injustice. And it can be about Gove, for example, leaving. I mean, I have never seen so many teenagers as excited as they were when Gove moved on. But not only this, this, but they're doing this for fun. They're doing this in their spare time. They're choosing to do this, which makes it even more important that we know that they are doing this. There's nothing we can do about it, but we just need to know that they are doing this. And so they're growing up with a sense of social, resp social responsibility and they know how to influence. They know how to influence huge networks very quickly. It's also a generation without borders. Geography means nothing. They'll be talking to people on the other side of the world, from Ghana, from wherever, and they're quite happy doing that. It doesn't make any difference to them. And so if you imagine these children who are now 16, 17, starting to come out onto the jobs market and all of those children behind them who have this awareness, who know how to influence, who know about social injustices, who understand as much as they want to about any topic that they choose to, existing in this world with no borders and therefore effectively no governance. Don't underestimate them. I'm making them sound scary. They're not that lovely. You just have to know. Work. So, uh, as I'm seeing the 97ers that I know through Young Rewired State and my eldest, they're starting to look at work now. If you remember at the beginning when I said they've grown up with recession, worldwide recession, and terrorism. But the worldwide recession is the thing that affects their work more than anything. Because they've grown up seeing that the traditional safe jobs, going and working for large organizations, the things that most teenagers will do is kind of go and slot into the bottom of an organization somewhere and then work their way up. But for them, all they've ever known is that working in such places is the most insecure and dangerous thing you can do to your family because their parents, their friends' parents, all these people have either lost their jobs or worried about losing their jobs, and there's been profound effect in every single community. And so it means now, when they're taught, their teachers are asking them to start looking for work or they're, they're um, trying to get some cash in their summer holidays, which is what they're trying to do at the moment, for them, it's very unsafe to go into this space. It's much more safe to be an entrepreneur, which is why these coding skills, everything that Code Club do, everything that YRS peer-to-peer -peer stuff do, very important teaching them these skills. But that's also why we're seeing such a huge leap now in these teenage entrepreneurs, because it's the safest thing that they can do is to employ themselves and employ each other. But the problem is that the, because these 97ers, the ones who are just now coming out into the kind of early job market, 
don't have anybody ahead of them. They don't have anybody to look to because no one else has this network community of learning that these kids do. And so they're fumbling around a bit. And what I'm seeing is a lot of these children are regressing back into their computers. They're spending more time online. But they're not spending more time online and wasting it. They're spending more time online because they're trying to find other people who have found their way through this strange place where they're being forced into taking, as far as they're concerned, a very high risk job in an organization that's likely to fall down in a couple of years. And then their peers who are similarly casting around and starting to set up their own businesses. So they're looking, they're looking for leaders. They are spending more time back in their networks and looking at what is happening next because that's all they've ever known is to look for reassurance to each other. And there will be people that come out of this. There will be a lot of people that are not choosing to go to sixth form college, for example. And then those kids that take the more traditional route through to doing their A-levels in university, they'll have a whole bunch of people that they can look to. But right now, a lot of them are spending time here. And so for me, my plea is don't just assume that they're wasting their time and that they're just lying about on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, doing nothing rather than getting on with what they should be doing, going and working at Marks and Spencers. Because they're not. They're trying to help each other. Education. Finally. I just had to explain all of the different things before I came on to the education bit of it. But obviously, education is why we're here. And um, an education is important. So, Ivan Illich um, wrote a um, book called De-Schooling Society. You can read it for free online. He wrote it in 1971, which is the year I was born, funnily enough. And he says this at the beginning. Educational webs which heighten the opportunity for each one to transform each, mo each moment of living into one of learning, sharing, and caring. And I love the fact that he talks about heightening and transforming, because that's what this is all about. It's not about scariness, it's about how do you transform lives through the connectedness that we have now. I fully believe that the coding movement crisis thing that we have going on at the moment with um, teachers having to very quickly skill up in, in programming and trying to keep ahead of their students and obviously fighting a losing battle because no one is going to be able to keep ahead of these students with programming because new languages are being created all the time. New ways of working online are being created all the time. Repositories are created. It becomes much easier. But if you're a teacher, you're, going to, you're just going to go nuts trying to keep up with that. And there isn't any curriculum anywhere that's going to be able to keep up with it. So the only thing that is working is the flipped classroom methodology, where you have children learning outside the classroom and bringing that back into the classroom. So for me, in Young Rewired State, the thing that we've been seeing, because the kids that are in YRS tend to be the self-taught programmers, the one child per school who's forever trying to hack into the dinner menu and change their mates' grades. Those guys are awesome. But they're also teaching each other. So they taught themselves, and what I see in Young Rewired State is their peer-to-peer -peer learning working beautifully across age groups. You've got a seven-year-old teaching a 10-year-old. You've got a 10-year-old teaching a 16-year-old. You have an 18-year-old teaching a five-year-old. You know, so you, it's just, it doesn't matter, but this peer-to-peer -peer learning works very well outside the classroom. And if you imagine that then what they do is they come back into the classroom and they share their learning, so it just gets bigger and bigger and more exciting, which is why the Wikipedia education program is so spot on. 
So we already know that the 97ers are immersed in this community. And we already know that this community builds a whole strength around them, not just about learning. And they're not even aware that this is weird or different. They just don't know any different. So they are already in this network community. They're already learning from, from each other. And so for them, it's not a great leap for them to learn outside the classroom and share inside. But the coding crisis, which has put this front and center of everything from ministers all the way through to parents who are worried, is a tipping point for education, I think. Because it doesn't stop with coding. It applies to history, science, geography, music, art, everything. Go and find out what you can outside, bring it into the classroom and share. Illick, again, that's my kitten, that's great. He says this, the operation of a peer match network would be simple. The user would identify himself by name and address and describe the activity for which he sought a peer. A computer would send him back the names and addresses of all those who had inserted the same description. It's amazing that such a simple utility has never been used on a broad scale for publicly valued activity. This was in 1971. So 43, remember I was, I was born then, so I haven't done quick maths, it's how old I am. 43 years later, and we're kind of going, that's a really good idea. But he did miss the kittens. He didn't see that coming. So, I'm forever trying to explain this to people. It is nothing to do with the internet. It's about the communities that are on there that just break everything. But it's amazing. And these 97 is no, no different, but they are here. And they are here worldwide. You know, this is affecting everybody. And they are, in a few years' time, going to be the teachers, going to be the politicians. They're also going to be the warlords. They're going to be moving into all of the different careers that they choose. Some of them, obviously, programming, but, you know, everything. Around the world, they'll grow up. So over the next five years, by 2020, they will all be breaking all of the different things that they go into because they don't know any different. I have some working with me in Young Rewired State, where they're ex-YRSs who help me out. Whenever I face a problem or a challenge in the business or the organization of some massive event that we're putting on, for example, they very quickly find a solution to it, and they just cannot see why it is not possible. Those things just, it just doesn't compute. And they're right. But when you think of all of those things that I talked about earlier, they know that they have a right to their own voice. They know that they're listened to. And they also know when they're not listened to, they've learned how to get their, communi get their communities um, active and supporting them or validating what they say. They don't know any different. But they are about to hit the working world. And, um, and I think we have to brace for them a little bit. Um, and we also have to nurture them and help them because whilst they know no different, and of course they're going to support each other, we need to prepare them with all of the other stuff that they don't know. But we have to like not be afraid of them, and we have to not stifle them. Blatant plug there for the Festival of Code next year. Sign up. It's free. Um, so. That was me scampering through a lot of content. And I want now for you to be able to ask me questions, and I'll answer them if I can. But I'm winging this as much as anybody else is. It is just what I'm seeing in my own family and amongst the hundreds of kids in YRS. Thank you. All right, I'm coming up to you, sir. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Hi, Emma. Um, Hi. I was just wondering, 
I'm working at UCL doing a project for digital business skills, and we've been looking at trying to create an online resource for a mix of people to learn about business and the digital side of business. But we created three personas. One is this young buster type who can do things on their own. They can find things, search themselves, sort it all out, apparently. The second is a switcher. So someone maybe middle-aged, working somewhere. They don't really feel connected to the place. They want to leave. They don't get technology. They don't know how to do it on themselves, but they really, really want to. And then there's the grafter, these long timers, been in business forever, but don't understand technology either. There must be a way of bringing these people together. Is this something that is attractive to your organization, your group, or is this something that's a real challenge? Because surely there's a level of mentorship here. People yeah, totally. People with more experience coming together under a, a, an umbrella idea of maybe even using technology as the scapegoat for connecting people. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, there's um, two things I'd say about that. Um, with the young rewired state community, because they are still very difficult to find these kids. It, it is still like pulling teeth. Um, and so that's why over six years we are at 1,000. We should be at a lot more, but we're not. What I was waiting for really was what happened this year, which was a kind of slight tipping point into kind of, we weren't having to actually physically phone schools and get the name of the kid in the library. Um, they all just came. So um, what I wanted, my dream always was that we would have this core of young people who would teach each other through Coda Dojos, Code Club, all of those other movements that are out there, but just these kids would be the mentors. So, for example, the challenges that Code Club face with you know, running out of mentors that are going to be able to help. Ideally, if we keep giving these kids this kind of community, which is so important to them, they'll be able to do that. But another thing that we're, we're always asked about um, older people. And, um, and so later this year, we're launching a program called Rewired Stately, which is not age, <laughs> but it's, um, it's just about people who are kind of once coders or people that just want to brush up on their skills or parents that want to be able to help their kids with homework. And that's going to be run by the mentors and the YRSs themselves, just, but it's going to be much more structured learning um, because you know, people are more comfortable that aren't the 97 is with structured learning. So yeah, that in October, watch out. Another question. Oh, right behind me. Um, hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying about not being scared of young people and basically treating them with respect and understanding where they're coming from. And I think that is incredibly important. Um, but I suppose the thing that worries me slightly about some of what you've said is that what I see is the internet reproducing the social inequalities that already exist in society. And, you know, gender's been talked about a lot mm -hmm. here, but there's also, you know, race and poverty and all of that kind of stuff. And I just... Um, yeah, I guess the thing that you said at the end about, like, we shouldn't abandon our kids, you know, our young people, and I think that's incredibly important, and I think they, uh, it seems to me like they need, they need a firm grounding in understanding about the inequalities of life as well, so I'd be interested mm. to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I mean... I've, I've never understood why people talk about cyberbullying, for example, because it's just bullying, you know? It's, it's bullying online, offline, whatever, it's just bullying. And, um, I mean, there's no kind of cyber anything, but, I mean, obviously things can be exacerbated by these communities, of course, and a lot of them are becoming self-policing. They'll do so more, I think, as these 97ers and all the kids that come after them um, mature. But you're right, and you know we have to work hard to ensure that um, race and gender and your financial status is no barrier. I mean, it's certainly in, in the stuff that I do in YRS, of course, that's you know that's what we do. We work hard to get girls. We've got 30% this year, which was a massive bonus for us. Um, it's not good enough, but you know it was fine. And um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's I think it's more about trying to forget that the digital world is any different to the real world. 
And so in the same way as we can't kind of put a big red ring around cyberbullying and saying that's the kind of stay safe online people and go, this is bullying, it needs to be dealt with in the same way that you deal with bullying. You can't do that with anything, you know? Everything has to be that this, this world of communities, whether it be online or offline, because there is no real difference, it's still people. And um, so, yeah, I, you're completely right. And we do need to kind of just drop this digital element of it. I saw someone you. down here. Yes. Okay. Hi. A lot of times the people, when they talk about the young, the 97ers or even younger ones or people around that age learning how to code or uh, like embracing them, they talk about if we don't do that, we're going to lose this much money in economy because they could be entrepreneurs, or that sort of argument. Right. Uh, my question is, do you think, is there enough talk or is there, are there enough people thinking about how we can embrace this generation of people coming to our society in terms of like with full rights in a few years' time and kind of embracing the their experience growing up in a less hierarchical online society, more international, less boundaries. Uh, you know, they could learn something that someone had to go to Oxford 30 years ago on course era in a matter of weeks. Um, are we ready to use this experience to empower older institutions like parliament and like, uh, you know, old educational establishment? Or is that something that we have to wait two or three generations till someone embraces their experiences? Um, I, I had pretty much exactly the same question nodded at me on a digital democracy thing. It was like, what do we do with our politicians that don't know how to engage online? Are we going to train them or what are we going to do? And someone else was just like, we just have to wait for them all to die. I don't think it's quite that bad. I, d I, d you know, I think, you know, obviously it's not, it's not that bad. And, you know, these, the 97ers, are naive in lots of ways, very naive. I don't fully buy into the coding is the next way everybody's going to become a millionaire instantly. No, it's just not. There's a, there's a kind of a finite number of people who are um, going to be able to program to that level for a start. Um, it's more, for me, it's more about recession. For me, it's more about the world that they've grown up in, which is very insecure, and so that's creating lots of entrepreneurs because it's the safest thing they can think of doing. But I think what we can do to support that is to give them all of the skills, so the business skills that you were talking about in UCL, giving them those skills and helping them understand what it is like to work in a world of business and to set up their own, uh, their own businesses. I mean, they certainly don't, from what I've seen anyway, very few of them do this to kind of, you know, set something up, sell it in five years for five million. That's not the thing anymore. The thing is, set something up, employ yourself, employ your peers. So it's, I think it's more about kind of understanding that from the basis of what they've grown up experiencing rather than the fact that they all need to learn coding. One more, time for one more. Ah, oh, in the purple. Hi, thank you very much to, uh, for your talk today. I was um, curious about your statement before about how um, this generation uh, is, comes in with a lot of um, ideas and that we need to be able to train them for the things that they don't know. Um, my, my question to you is, how do you do that in a way such that we don't kind of force this generation into a mold where they feel obligated to kind of abandon innovation and ideas and creativity that they may want to bring but I guess feel pushed to kind of, uh, to push away t in an effort to kind of fit in. Yeah. Um, excellent question. Um, so I'm really gonna be talking on the fly here, I'm just making this up, but this is what I think. I think that if we, it's the same with anything else, if we find the leaders, so those leaders that I was talking about that they're looking for at the moment because they're just like, what do we do? I don't wanna go and work for Marks and Spencers, it's scary. When those kids start to come out, so even like the, the YouTubers that are kind of making lots of money on YouTube and other people that are setting up those, those kind of entrepreneurial things, make those kids, those young people that are doing that, fit into the rest of the world in a way that, you know, we kind of shoehorn ourselves around that and just let um, the, their peers, so let the other 97ers see how that can work in the world that they are growing into. And they're not, they're not expecting it to go away anyway, you know, but I think that's, that's, um, that's the first thing that we can do to um, prepare for them and to help them do this. 
but the trying to mold them into a shape where they have to um, follow a traditional path of be that learning or working or, or anything else is it's just going to create more years of confusion it's like trying to potty train a child too early you can't do it you have to wait until they're ready and then you go right now we just have to allow them that time i think this is just a very specific period of time that we're in right now because once these kids have got to 2020 for example once the kids have got there then for all of the ones that are coming behind them they've got people to follow they know what they're doing so it is a very specific thing to kind of the next five years but yeah it's just kind of try and make that normal rather than trying to make them normal thank you so much emma okay. a round of applause for thank you Emma Mulqueenie. Thank you. Um, so you had an opportunity to put questions to Emma and Claire, but not Diana yet. So if it's all right, could I ask you to proceed to the, um, to the informal Q&A point, which is, as we all remember, that side of the foyer near the press room, so you can bombard her with questions. And we are on a break now, and we'll see you in about 15 minutes for Lila's keynote. Thanks.
I do? Thank you. Elegant Thank you. We'll see. You would totally do that. <laughs> no, 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 not, not, not if he was saying as an aside to me. He was texting me earlier that he was really excited last night. So. Thank you, so thank you. You can do it to me in front of you, baby, but not, not just to me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm testing all the mics. What does this do? <laughs> Hello. We didn't do a sound check. So I'm gonna do a sound check right now. Can you hear me? In the back, put up your hands. Can you hear me? Very good. <laughs> Great. I'm gonna talk into two different microphones. One of them will work. So welcome, what is it? Is it day two of Wikimania? The final session of day two. Um, for anybody here who doesn't know me, my name is Sue Gardner. I was the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation from 2007 until this past June. 18 months ago, I told the Board of Trustees that I was leaving my position and um, we then kicked off the search for my successor. It took 18 months plus or minus a little bit, um, which is a long time. And the reason it took so long is because uh, it's such an odd job, right? It's such an unusual job, and there's no obvious CV that suggests someone's next position should be running the Wikimedia Foundation. It's a unique organization in a million ways. It kind of operates at the intersection, we all know, of like international, global nonprofit, uh, community organization, um, technology organization, international institution of knowledge, it's a weird place uh, to be the boss of. Our first DD was a lawyer, our second DD was me, I came from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and it was not obvious. Um, did someone just do a shout out for the CBC Canada? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and it wasn't obvious where our next DD was gonna come from. It's a weird job, it requires an unusual mix of skills and experiences, and in some ways, most importantly, a particular set of values. We knew it was gonna take us a long time to find somebody who was right for the role and right for the organization. It did take us a long time, and I'm really happy about where we ended up. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to introduce you to the next DD of the Wikimedia Foundation. You have met her yesterday, um, but this is her first, I think, real presence at Wikimedia and on this stage, and so I'm gonna set the stage for that. <clears throat> Lila Tretikov, many of you will have met her or spoken with her briefly. She comes to the Wikimedia movement from um, Sugar CRM, where she was the chief product officer, and she has a long and extensive background in technology and in product development. She also has a lot of the soft skills and the sort of ancillary skills that are important for success in the Wikimedia movement. She's got a background in open source, which is reasonably rare, and we were very happy to find someone who had that. 
She has a default orientation, I think, towards transparency and openness and honesty and directness, which I think is important and valuable in our movement. She is a citizen of the world, born and raised in Russia, moved to the United States as a teenager. And she has what I hope and trust is an unshakable commitment to freedom of speech. And I think that she is also, it's hard to gauge this kind of thing, I think she is also a person who has the courage to defend the values of the Wikimedia movement when the projects need protection, which is unfortunately less rare than we might wish. What? <laughs> is someone yoing me? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> is it fixed? Fixed enough? Okay. So Lala's been on the job for about three months, I think just a little bit over three months. And I think that in that time, I've spent part of that time hiding in Iceland on holiday. I think in that time she has been doing a lot of thinking, she's been doing a lot of reading, she's been doing a lot of talking to different people, and a lot of listening to them as well. And I think that it would be clearly unfair um, for us in this room to expect her to stand up here and roll out like a 10-point plan with a bunch of deliverables and milestones and so forth. So I hope that nobody is expecting that. But I think that what we are going to get, and I hope that what she's going to give us, is a sense of her initial thoughts about the movement, the impressions that she's starting to form, and um, some sense of what we're going to be there's a fly. Some sense of what we're going to be able to expect from her and from the Wikimedia Foundation in the months and the years ahead. I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a very, very, very warm Wikimedia welcome to Lila Tretikov, our new ED. Good evening, let's hope this works and doesn't buzz. Let's try it. Okay, so I am really excited that you guys are awake right now because I'm finding it, I'm not sure I really am, I'm kind of in this haze thinking this might be a little bit of a delirium, so make some noise, wake me up. Ah! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I am going to exit this for a second because it's not working. And you'll see. Oh, nope. Clearly we have some technical difficulties. Let me just go into regular presenter mode and see if that works. Okay. So uh, Sue told you a little bit about um, this is drinking from the fire hose. And every day it feels like facing the next big thing in your life. Um, so I called this presentation Facing the Now. But before I talk about what I see this now, um, given that I am uh, three months in and two months in as an ID, um, so my impressions are still evolving and changing, I want to talk a little bit about the past. So what I will go through is the past, the future, and what do we need to do today? We have an incredible success in our past. And all of the success is not a success of a corporation building itself up not success of an idea, a one special idea. It's a success of an idea that happened, that evolved, idea that you owned. This is incredible and unique and really, really important. And it's very, very rare. And because it's so rare, and because it happens to so few of us, it is also incredibly, incredibly precious. But it's also a big challenge. 
Many, many of you probably have heard about this term, innovator's dilemma. And just in a couple of words, for those of you who have not, the short version of it, it's a phenomenon of doing something incredibly incredible, something that takes the world by storm and changes it. And then, like with good art, with good inventions, with incredible things that we do, getting really, really attached to it. So developing the resistance to change, to change it in any way, because it's so, so precious. So there's this quote, as I was going through this, I was pulling out um, different pieces from Wikipedia projects and from comments from all the different, uh, different sites. And I know this quote from before, and I always thought that it was Ford's quote. He said that if I ask people what they wanted, I would develop a faster course. This is not what we've done here. But as we go through now, because of this phenomenon, because of this in a various dilemma thing, um, everybody, every human being falls into that bucket of d incremental improvement. Turns out, by the way, that you guys figured out that it, we don't know if it's a Ford's quote, actually at all. But I find it relevant anyways. So. God, oh no, this is precious, this is scary, this is amazing. So what, what do we do? <laughs> and, and we love it. So um, another researcher, um, in, uh, and in this case, it was uh, somebody who's studying um, uh, communications and not, uh, not markets and technology, develop this thing that's called diffusion of innovation, which basically tells us that we go through a cycle from early adopters to saturation um, of an idea. And while some of our newer projects are still going through the curve, you see that second yellow line over there? It's a delayed indicator. It's also actually an S-curve. So the, what happens at some point, an idea takes the market share. English Wikipedia, one would argue, is in the market share mode where we own it. This is the main source of knowledge for everything that the world goes to for encyclopedic knowledge, right? So one thing that this particular theory has been criticized about, and uh, by the way, the sources of, of this is also Wikipedia, um, is that that S-curve is actually the, the yellow curve eventually also goes down. That means that another innovation comes along and does exactly the same, and they repeat. So, when you've won, when you've succeeded, the biggest risk next is actually doing nothing. And that's a hard thought to grapple with. Because it's just not intuitive. It seems like if you are trying to, uh, if you have something sp special, if you have something important, if you make a move, you can ruin it. But in reality, innovations are more like walking a tightrope. If you stop, you can lose your balance. And in fact, Technologies are not static. They move, and the reality is, as special as we are, we are facing people who want, who, who are our competition, who can make a lot of money out of what we do, and would love to be doing it. So, how do we get out of this? How do we continue? What do we need to do? You've imagined a beautiful world. You've made it happen. You need to keep imagining. Let's talk a little bit about that. What if I told you that in the next 10 years, 
the web as we know it will disappear. What would you say? You'd say, Lila, you're nuts. <laughs> but then again, you know, um, people who were writing encyclopedias 15 years ago thought that you were nuts too. Let's look at these charts. So on the left, you see the growth of wired internet subscriptions. These are people who are plugging their laptops and desktops into a wire and using the internet. On the right, you see the mobile growth. Most of it, by the, by the way, is happening in the developing world. It's not here. Very, very important phenomenon. A world that's actually in understanding, has a different understanding, different usage patterns. But what is really important here, look at the left side of those charts. Do you see the order of magnitude change? Oops. Yeah, it's a little bit like that. The, this change is so massive, it is eating up, like your favorite computer game from 20 years ago, um, it is eating up the world as we know it today. And in fact, our users are changing. They're different from what they were five years ago. They're different from the way we were 10 years ago. And they're gonna be different tomorrow. And it's really important for us to understand how are they changing. And this beautiful picture <laughs> taken, uh, uh, taken by, uh, by Victor, um, you see, this is probably a few years back. Now, this is not the only device out there. In fact, they're gonna be different, different things. What is, what is it gonna look like? What is, what is our interaction with technology, the world's interaction, the next generation inter, generation of interaction with, with technology and knowledge is going to look like? And you're probably already experiencing that. Somebody here in the front row is having, I think, augmented reality right on their face. It's happening. The technology is gonna tell you what you need to know, when you need to know, in now, in real time. Not five minutes before, not five minutes after. It's, it's, it's real, it's happening. And it's not going to be, um, you're gonna be able to access it a thousand times a day. Right? It's gonna be point in time, it's going, to, it's going to give you the right bits of information and it's, not, it's going to know what you specifically care about. And whether we like it or not, it's, it's happening already and it's happening today. And this means people's interaction with data and knowledge is going to change as well. The user experience that people have, both on the receiving end, but also on the contributing end. And that's the really, really interesting part. We need to be thinking about what do those contributions actually look like? Even today, when we think about how you contribute, there are actually many, many different ways and many different passions that you have. Some of you like to write long form articles. Others really love to hunt for data. And yet some other people just love to make it look beautiful. So we're already experiencing that. We're just not the same. All of us are different. But imagine what it's gonna look like tomorrow. Imagine a camera a device that somebody is wearing who can tell us what's normal about a heartbeat rate. You know, what's, what is the access going to look like? And how are those contributions going to change? And this is important because you know better than anybody else, you know better than I, that imagination is real. So this, is one of my, this was one of my favorite books when I was, um, when I was growing up, it's probably nine or 10. This is the, um, the Nautilus book by Jules Verne. Um, and as you remember, he imagined basically a submarine. And guess what, of course, 
we have them now. And the amazing part is that's not the only example, right? There's uh, millions of examples of human imagination, things that are futuristic and seem impossible. Well, they happen. And people here and people outside of those walls are the ones who can make them happen. So, the challenge I want to put out to you is imagining the world in which everyone can contribute. It's a much more narrow focus that Jimmy puts in front of you. But it's a question that you probably are not asking yourself about. How can we make, how can we enable everybody to give something? Not just to share and receive, but that specific piece. How can we make sure that everybody can participate? And it's not the world that we have today. In fact, I will challenge you that you are the specialists. You are the people who are really good at contributing. You are the people who need to help us figure out what does it mean to teach the rest of the world, to give the rest of the world a way to participate. So let's look at the now. Let's look at the tactical reality that we need to we need to be facing and we need to work on. So on the left, you see the Wikipedia. This is really how we're understood today by the outside world. Of course, we internally know. We have many different projects. We're very passionate about them. But ask somebody else from the outside, all they know is Wikipedia. They know a website. We talk about community, in fact, many communities. Those of you, some of you are here. And in many ways, participating, participation is work. So how do we move that over? How do we move it closer to the vision that Jimmy put in front of us 12, 13 years ago? How do we move towards a place where the knowledge is integrated, with one, where all of our projects actually make sense together, the ones that do make sense together? How do we move from website to mobility, or potentially even further out as new ways to interact emerge, from the community to any user participation in, in some, uh, some different, lighter weight ways, and how do we make it more fun? More fun for everyone. So I am going to talk a little bit about the foundation and the work that we need to do and where I see our, our strength and our part in making this happen. Foundation is actually a really interesting word because that's exactly what we need to be. And with exactly what we are, we just need to keep up-leveling and improving on that. We need to be that foundation. And what does it actually mean? What is that foundational support for everything that everybody else does or, uh, in this movement actually means? So let's talk about the sites. And the sites is many things. It's the technology, it's the software, it's making sure everything is up. But the things that we really, really, really need to be working at is taking all of the talent that we have, both internally and externally, and making sure the technology that we have is ready for tomorrow. Not just the features. Of course, yeah, we need to catch up with features. But the underlying infrastructure of software that can be extended and can be easily modified and can be lightweight enough to actually support all of those different modes of communication and different modes of consumption and different modes of uh, contribution that are already happening and are only going to increase. So that's, that's number one. We need, to, we need to get that piece ready. Number two, we really need to figure out 
how to think beyond the group of people that we're surrounded by. And that's a really hard thing to do, for companies to do. Um, as as um, companies, communities, and just human organizations grow, we're not designed to think of billions. We're not designed to think of, okay, how do I figure out what makes sense? We take, we take stock in the people that we know. We uh, ask 100, 200, 1,000 people maybe at most. The entirely different mode of thinking has to be operating at a scale of billions and understanding what works for people as, as part of the overall equation. And, and that requires an entirely different process around how we think of building and deploying what we do. Oh. Technology today, there's, we have buzzing, we, we have... Uh, we have visual problems. Now, clearly, this must be, uh, I, I, I must be sleeping. Okay, so funding. Funding is definitely another foundational piece. And a lot of you, you know, when I came into the foundation, this is the piece that's, that's working. It's, uh, it's working well. Um, everybody seems to, you know, seems to think that's easy. But remember, Again, this is changing. It's actually not easy because how people are going to be interacting with information is going to change, and we're going to have to figure out how is that, that we're going to, make, we're going to be able to support all of the things that we need to do as people change those modes of operation. So if we're giving somebody a data on the fly, on the audio, what does it mean for us to be able to actually support this project? So this is not a given either. And finally, the programs. So, somebody tell me, why is it always a woman supporting that like ceiling? I was always wondering when I was like 13, I would walk around, around in Moscow and I'd be like, always ladies. Interesting. So, the programs I just touched on is really, are really important. Both programs and how we understand the needs, develop and deliver the user interface design and uh, technical work that needs to be, that needs to be rethought and, and uh, improved, but also programs that are pushed out, right? So today we do, we provide funding to different organizations, we provide funding to volunteers, but we're not thinking of those things as, as clear programs. What are, we, what are we after there? And how do we enable you, not just financially, but enable you with all of the different types of tools, connections, materials, um, in other words, programs? We need to be thinking about that as well. Because within any organization, technology is actually not, not enough. So if I had to put it in a nice, nice package, we need to focus, we need to simplify, and I don't mean by that just the user experience, but simplify what we do, how we do it, and the process by which it is done, clarify it, make it easier for you as well, and then ultimately scale it up. So we have to face reality. We're different. Foundation has a big role, but it's a different role. But we're also together. We need to figure out how to support each other. And how to work together as one and unified whole. So, it doesn't just take technology. It takes a social change. It takes a change in thinking that as special as we are, we aren't, we aren't that special that we're invincible. In fact, we're vulnerable. And we need others. We need generations. We need people around the world to join us, to make us stronger, to help us be more inventive. So, I have a test for you.
You know, a lot of us talk about being more polite, being nicer, saying thank you. We have a great feature called thanks. Actually, I really liked it. It made me feel better. It made me feel like I wasn't a complete idiot when I did my first edit. Um, but I want you to count the number of times you hear the words, the words, you're welcome. This means somebody else thanked you. This means you opened the door and you helped somebody walk through it. I want you to count them. And I want you to have as many of them, collect as many of them as possible. And with that, I want to thank all of you. That was wonderful. Uh, there is, uh, there are f there's food and drink outside, and I'm still carrying around this lens cap, so <laughs> check your camera and come find me if it's yours. Good night. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, sorry. And there's some fantastic performance and comedy going on in here later. Um, we've got the Comedian's Bookshelf and uh, The Missing Bits, with, uh, which is a show by my friend Dan Schreiber, who is very funny, much funnier than me, so do stick around for that. See you tomorrow.